Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. We are Coast to Coast AM. Hey there, Connie Willis, your host. One of the people that I've known for quite a while now. In fact, he was a blue rocker as well. And uh, a lot of people know him in that Pacific Northwest area and beyond. His name is Tom Cantrell, and he's got a lot of stories to tell. He's got books out there, too. You can find them at TomCantrell.com. So that is Tom as in T-H-O-M, T-H-O-M, and Cantrell is C-A-N-T-R-A-L-L.com. Check him out. Check out all his books. He's got many of them, and he's got many stories, and he continues to research as much as he can, um, whether it's online or out in the field. I think it's 13 books with Sasquatch. Let's go ahead and bring Tom in. I report it as I see it. Okay? you got to yep. remember that we can't prove anything to anybody. All we can do is offer evidence. And it's up to the individual to decide how much evidence constitutes proof in their own mind. Because everybody has that different level. So when I see something and I report it, it may sound strange. But it's what I saw. I've beaten death a few times, sometimes with help. I uh, first got into this, first learned about Sasquatch, and got into the investigation of it back in 1958. That's 65 years ago. Um, I was a sophomore in high school, 15 years old, when a gentleman uh, building roads came to work on Monday morning, and around his cap, up and down the road were these 16-inch tracks that would come down off the mountain, walked up the road around his cap, then on up to the next one, and uh, went on up and disappeared. And he kept coming back. Every every uh, day or two, he, there was tracks to be back again. And he did some things, too, that weren't quite kosher. He, uh, Threw some uh, fuel barrel down in the canyon one time. He threw a, an excavator tire down in the canyon. He threw uh, a 20-foot length of 24-inch culvert. And if you've ever worked with culvert, you know what a steel culvert 20 feet long weighs. It's uh, well yeah. over a couple hundred pounds. And that was tossed down in the canyon. And uh, so I don't think he was really happy with the road builders working there. The fellow's <laughs> name was Jerry Crew. And this happened, in, like I say, in 1958. The actual incident started on the 25th of August of 1958. But the uh, newspaper article didn't come out until the 4th of October. And the reason for that, it took time. Finally, one of the wives of one of the crewmen there uh, said, you know, went to call the newspaper. And uh, the editor, a gentleman by the name of Andrew Genzoli, uh, assured her that there weren't wild men wandering around the mountains in Northern California. That uh, you know that they were they were seeing something else and didn't know what it was. Then it came. Jerry had uh, cast some tracks, and he was in Eureka for uh, on the weekend. And Andrew Genzoli heard he was there and got a hold of him and asked him to come in. And there's pictures taken of Jerry with his track cast at that time. And when Andrew wrote up the newspaper article, that's the first time in print that the word Bigfoot occurred. Okay. Oh. That ran local, and then the wire services picked it up the next day. And that's when I saw it. And my dad had a way of instilling curiosity in me. And when he saw the article in the paper, and he called me and said, what do you think of this? Tell me what you think. Well, we knew the country. It wasn't that far from where we lived, about 300 miles, but we had been hunting in that area. And uh, so we knew the country. 
and I read it, and it, it lit a fire. Uh, with that incident, a world-renowned paleontologist, Ivan P. Sanderson, came in, did, did the study on it, wrote a magazine article for it. One magazine article appeared in Argosy, another one in True. And you've got to remember at that time in history, that was our Internet. That's how information got passed with these magazines. Uh, there were, you know, a gazillion of them being published at that time in the, in the late 50s and through the 60s because there was no mass communication other than that. Of course, I got these, mag- these articles, and I read them cover to cover to cover to cover to cover. And finally got through high school in 61, joined the Navy, spent nine years in the Navy on submarines, drove into town in April of 1968 and picked up a newspaper to start looking for a place to live. And the headlines in the newspaper that day said, housing shortage most critical since World War II. And here I am trying to find housing, okay? (laughs) Typical. Uh, So after searching for a while, I went to the base, and they had a house at an annex up on, on the peninsula, and I lived there, and that was absolutely wonderful. I mean, it was like our own our own uh, country club, but there were eight houses on the whole island. They even had a boat there for us to use, and it was great. But Perfect. There, during that time, that's when I started being able to do real research. Up to this time, I had just been reading everything that I could find on the subject. So, of course, during this time, the uh, Tom Slick expeditions were undergoing, and I followed those. And then the Patterson Gimlin film came out in 67, but I didn't see that till 68 because I was on patrol at the time that it happened and didn't see it till next year when I come or the next time we were in port. And that was just before I, I left, uh, left the boat in, in um, March, March of 68 yeah, and came to Washington. And I've been in Washington ever since. But living up on a peninsula, that afforded me the chance to get out in the woods where they live. Because believe mm-hmm. me, the Olympic Peninsula is one of the prime real estates for Sasquatch. Yeah, yeah. And I got out of the Navy in 70, started college. Uh, ended up getting a degree in logging and engineering. Uh, that said, I have never worked a day as an employee for a company as a logging engineer. I got out and found out what they paid. And I had a little Gippo <laughs> logging company going, and it was paying me more than that was. Mm-hmm. But what I did do is I did consulting work. In the state of Washington, if you're going to uh, build a road that crosses a stream used by a madrimous fish run, that's that migrate from the ocean and back to fresh water to spawn, you have to have a permit from the state. And to get that permit, you have to have a total plan for how you're going to cross that water. So that's what they would hire me to do. Of course, their own engineers would do the ones next to the road. I got the ones that were five or six or seven miles back on timber. And uh, But that's all right. I could make more money on a weekend doing one of those contracts than I could in a month as an engineer working for them. So I didn't mind. Uh, it was just extra money. But I'd hike in, and I learned really quickly that you do not, uh, you know, take your measurements and hike out and sit down that night and start doing your drawings and find out, you know, oh, oh I forgot one measurement. That'll ruin your whole day to have to hike back in six or seven miles the next day just to get one measurement. So I would sit down at the edge of the stream and do a quick drawing just to make sure I had all the facts, all the figures that I needed, all the measurements, all the flow types, the stream flows, everything that that I needed. These were all things that went into this report, including, you know, how are you going to cross the across the stream, you know, what do you have for abutments on both ends and just everything involved. Um, then when I got it all drawn up, then I'd, when I saw I had everything, I'd hike back out again. Well, it was during this, I was sit there and all of a sudden 
you'd see an eyeball peeking around the tree at you. You hear this whistle, just a little up down whistle, but it goes. And for years, I didn't know what that was. I just thought it was a bird that I hadn't classified yet, but I never could see the bird. I could hear the whistle, but I couldn't see the bird. And finally, you know, when I found out, ninth or 2010, at a conference in Eugene, Oregon, the first time I heard Ron Moorhead's uh, <laughs> Ron <Marathon's laughs> tape, and there it is on it. I, that's what that is. Doesn't take me long, does it? What I found out is, you know, I've got my eye on him over here. It's okay. You know? so, and that's what they're doing. They're just curious as to why I was. I mean, there hadn't been anybody there in 400 years. This is old growth timber. <laughs> <laughs> nobody goes into that. There's no game there, so so nobody goes into that uh, that far back into that thing. There's no feed there, so there can't be any game. They'd be curious as to why I was there, and they'd leave me signs. You know, I'd walk, be walking in, come to a little no-name stream, something you could step across, a little sandbar in the middle of it, and here's a 16-inch track right in the middle of the sandbar. Now, the last thing you're going to think is that somebody hiked in five miles to leave a track in a sandbar that nobody where nobody had been for 400 years. Mm. <laughs> that, that kind of stretches the mind a bit to believe that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that that's where we that's where we got that's started. Where, that was that's where it started. When I hear of people anywhere uh, in the logging world, I'm always like, oh, they know because they're you know. People, loggers and logging companies, they're right in the midst of all that, right? And it's always, oh, they got to know. And I'm surprised when people don't. During that time frame also, I got, I was, you know, I started seeing them pretty regularly. And uh, a lot of Were you seeing full bodies? You were seeing them, not just hearing them. At this time, I was just seeing eyeballs and part bodies from around trees. The first time I saw full bodies, my buddy and I, it was September and, uh, I was shut down for fire shutdown. It was it'd been dry, dry summer and dry fall, and so I was shut down. And uh, my buddy was a forester also, and uh, so he took a day off, and we were we were going out to go grouse hunting. Well, grouse hunting in September is a euphemism for being in the woods when the elk are screaming. It's uh-huh. just oh, if you've never been there, if you've never heard it, you gotta because there's nothing like listening to the elk scream and that bugle. And out on the peninsula, they have the Olympic or, or Roosevelt elk, which are the largest elk in North America. They're half again the size of the ones you have back in, in the eastern part of the country in Yellowstone and stuff like that. Are they pretty mean? Is that what you want to stay? Will they run at you or they stay no, their well, distance? You, if you Pick them up, they will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But generally speaking, I I could walk right along with a herd of cows, and right in amongst the herd, I use a cow call, and I just bark at them, and you know, and there were times I could reach over and touch one on the left side, and reach over and touch one on the right side. I was that close <laughs> to them, and that's what we did that day. We got wow. into a harem herd and followed them, followed them, and played with them, and till we busted them all up, and. Uh, the herd bull, a big five point bull, probably weighed about eleven hundred pounds, and uh, and a huge. Uh, of, I mean, uh, Yellowstone elk will weigh seven hundred, six hundred pounds. Mm-hmm. That's all. And this guy was upset, so we decided it was time to leave him alone, and started hiking back towards the truck. And of course, we'd gotten separated by that time, and. Uh, which is no big deal. We're both foresters. We know how to travel in the woods without direction. And uh, I was by myself, and I saw ahead of me this clearing in the woods. And that generally means water hole, especially in that country. It's low country, and it's very wet. And so I was going to sneak up on it and see what was hanging around the water hole. I got to the last big old spruce tree and peeked around it, there were two bear, and it wasn't a water hole. It turned out it was an area of blown down timber. It wasn't a little uh, microcosm area, probably five, six acres of blown down timber. And there were two bear feeding on the, uh, actually, on the mushrooms that were growing on the down trees. So 
So I decided to watch them for a little bit. And then one of them stood up. Uh, it wasn't a bear. No, it was a very nice eight-foot-tall Sasquatch. Wow. And, and very male, very obviously <laughs> male. Uh, How's so that? Obviously, <laughs> so obviously that I stood and saluted. Uh, no. <laughs> but, uh, and then he bent back down, started picking mushrooms again. Oyster mushrooms growing down, down the trees. They are delicious. Absolutely. Just pick them and eat them. I, oh, I envied them uh, being able to do that. But then his mate stood up and uh, looked around, you know, just checking for danger. And then that back down, they would alternate back and forth. And uh, I sat there about 20 minutes watching them. Then all at once, I felt a little gust of wind hit the back of my neck, and I knew I was busted. I mean, all four eyes just clicked right on me. So I just stood up and stepped away from the tree so they could see who was there and that I wasn't, it wasn't a danger to them. But he had, uh, he stepped back and gave her room to get back in the timber. And as she did, she reached down and picked, the, picked up a youth, a, a baby, and just put it, held it up to her chest and he hung onto her hair. And then she turned and started walking back into the timber. And as he turned to, to follow, I said, I wanted to thank you for showing me your family and sharing with me today. And he turned back, and I swear he nodded his head at me and then turned and walked walked away. They and, communicate, uh, yeah. Yeah. And that was the first time that I had gotten to see them full body length and be able to study them, do the Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall type thing. And in the day. And in the day, yes, yeah. And this is something that's very, very important as researchers. This is where some of the most in-demand speakers fail. You know, uh, people that I love dearly, uh, Cliff, Cliff Bergman, uh, D- Dr. Jeff Meldrum, as, as people, I love them dearly, but they don't know what they're talking about as far as what Sasquatch are. There are so many of these like this. They just have no idea until you do that. And that's yeah. only one time that's happened. That was just the first time. It's happened on multiple occasions since then. You know, the, there's a, a constant, anatomical constant taught in anatomy class in every college in the country. Your height is 6.5 times the length of your feet. So if you've got 10-inch feet, you're going to be 65 inches t- tall, 5 foot 5. Now, does that mean everybody in the world who has a 10-inch foot is going to be five, five, five inches tall? No. That's going to put you in the center of the bell curve. And then you'll have all the natural variations from that, the standard deviations, et cetera. But I wanted to know if we could find out more from that. Now, I was pretty good at judging weights because I bought a lot of cattle at auction. I had I ran cattle at that time. And I could judge their uh, steer's weight within 20 pounds salmon in the auction ring. And uh, so I started out with that. Now, I could just judge their weight. And I knew what I wanted to do is figure out height and weight from just the track. And so I knew the height, 6.5 times the length of the, of the track. Okay. To find the weight, I started out finding the area of the track. And in order to do that, I used an engineer's tool called a planimeter. It's used for finding the area of irregular shapes. And it just, you go around the perimeter of the, of the shape you want to measure, and it'll tell you how many square inches are inside of it. I did that and then divided that figure by the length of the foot. And that gave me the average width of the foot. And I did it enough times that I figured out that the average width for figuring the area is four-tenths of the length. So if you had a 15-inch foot length, takes 0.6 times that, 0.4 times that, that's, six, that's uh, four inches in width. All right? Pardon me, mm-hmm. six inches in width. 
Now, okay. that would give you 90 square inches of foot on the ground. Now, I started out by guesstimating their weight and then dividing that weight by that square inches of, of foot on the ground, and it gave me a figure. But I wanted to be more accurate than that. So what I did, I found some really good prints, and I built this tub with one foot on it. And I made that foot the size, you know, the square inch, the same square inches as the track I was measuring. Then I loaded that tub with sandbags until it sunk the same depth as the track I was uh, comparing it to. Mm. Okay. Now I had, I could had a weight. I could weigh those sandbags, and I knew what the weight was. I knew what the square inches was. It was just a simple matter of dividing. And it turns out, you give me a 15-inch track, and that's 90 square inches of foot on the ground. He's going to be 98 inches tall, and he's going to weigh 7.5 times that 90. Or what well, I think it's five hundred and sixty five pounds is what that comes out. Mm. All from just knowing the length of the track. And that came about because same area but a little different area. So I was going in to do a, a bridge site survey and came around the down log and here's a large male standing there eating huckleberries. Mm. And I walked right up on him. I mean we were eight feet apart. And I said, you know, oh, hi, fella. How are you doing today? You know, it's good to see you here. And uh, he looked at me, and now he's got a big round of saucers. And he just turned and walked off, kind of like Patty did in the Patterson Gimlin film. Did this one look like Patty? Because, you know, there's a variation of them. There's, yeah, they it, look. It, it, did, it, did, I mean, they have the same variation in looks that we have as people. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, uh, yeah, and uh, same di- and same difference in colorations. Yes, you know, I, yeah, I but this was a patty white. one. Yeah, this, this... Is, looks pretty much like patty. It was dark. Okay. And out on the Olympic Peninsula, they have very long hair on their arms. See, the reason for that long hair, that wicks the water off of them. And it rains, you know, 225, 250 days a year out there. And uh, so huh. it's uh, awful wet. And so he, where he walked off, the ground was really wet. I mean, the reason I was there that day was because it was the first day the river had dropped enough that I wouldn't be waiting to get to where I was going. And uh, I said, oh, what a wonderful chance to compare my footprint with his footprint. So I did. I walked where he walked, took my boots off, and walked where he walked. And then I did the measurement. You know, engineers, you have to measure everything. And that's what I did. I measured everything, and that's what got me started on this, on this uh, route to to find the weight and height from its track length. It was so just he, a fantastic thing to do. He just t- he was eight feet away, and he just turned and and walked away. Just turned and walked away. That's all. I did finish his his huckleberry too. Now that you mention it, but uh, <laughs> you know we shared <laughs> we had lunch together. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's cool that's cool yeah, yeah so we went on from there we uh um you know life life went on uh that was early 70s into the mid 70s now and late 70s i took a job working for a timber company down on right on the california oregon border right on the coast and uh i had to go inland if, uh, I was in charge of the cutter, timber cutters, and I hated that job. They hired me to build to be road boss, and then there was some problem with the amount of roads we were going to build. And they said, well, would you take over the tim- bull buck job for a while till, till our regular bull buck gets back, and by that time we'll be ready to build road again? I said, yeah, I can do that. And all I, all I did was keep good people from work, and I'd show up and they'd stop to talk, you know. And heavens, they knew as much, but more about falling redwood trees than I ever know, you know. And even the, the fur over in the interior on the jobs we had there, these were good good workers, good cutters. They didn't need me telling them how to do it. And uh, so all I did is stop them from working. But this, this particular time, I had to, it was a four-and-a-half-hour drive 
from the mill yard to that job. And then there was a road that was snowed in called the Go Road. It runs from Gaston, California on Highway 199 to Orleans, California. And uh, it was paved on both ends, but the middle was just a cat trail. There was just you know, cat dug out of the dirt and rocks, and that's all you had. And so what we did is we hauled a D7 cat in the west end, unloaded him and let him push snow, clear the road for us, and then picked him up uh, when he got out of the snow on the east end and carried him onto our road job. But in the meantime, we got a shortcut for the job, but it was only about 90 minutes now. And so if I had to be there at 6.30 in the morning, I didn't have to leave the house till 4.30, 5 o'clock. So, you know, I was able to sleep in at least and have breakfast. But this particular day, I was right up on top, on the, on the uh, dirt park, where he pushed the snow off the road. And I saw what looked like a, some bear tracks coming down with slight grade and crossing the road. I wanted to get up there and see, because I'm always looking for a good bear, you know, and, and especially a big boar. And I got up close, and they, they weren't bear tracks. They were, they, were, they were Sasquatch tracks. And I really wanted to follow them, but, you know, I had to meet the Forest Service, and I had to meet the road crew, and I had to meet my cutters. You just don't keep a $2.5 million logging uh, job waiting because you want to chase Sasquatch. They, they get really <laughs> upset at you if you do that. <laughs> so I went ahead and did everything I had to do. I stayed over the night there because I had a, a an appointment with the Forest Service first, first thing in the morning, the next morning, and then... As soon as I was done with them, I could head home. And that's what I did. I got back up to that spot about uh, about noon, and I started trailing them. And I tracked all afternoon. It was about evening. It was 6, 30, 7 o'clock when I got down to the bottom. And I think I was in Blue Creek. I'm not totally sure, but I think I was in the... By the way, you can learn more about Tom Cat Cantrell by going to his website and check out his many books and the different essays that he has too. TomCantrell.com. That's T H O M C A N T R A L L.com. You can always go to uh, Coast to Coast AM.com, our website, and you can look up his bio and his information there. You'll see all the links and stuff like that, too. George Nori, thanks for letting me be here, George. The Coast to Coast team and family right there. So until we meet again, please join me at ConnieWillis.com for Blue Rock Talk and Connie After Dark. I'll be back on the 28th. Looking forward to it. Keep watching the night skies and continue with me to seek out the strange and uncover the unknown. For Coast to Coast AM, I'm Connie Willis. Good night. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.